and she is here to talk to us about the president that lived in our county, so uh, President Hoover. So. Thank you, Tara. Well, as Sarah said, I'm Sarah Monroe, uh, director of the Hoover Minthorn House Museum, boyhood home of Herbert Hoover, our 31st president. He was raised in a strict Quaker home in West Branch, Iowa, where he was born, and in Newburgh and Salem, Oregon, where he spent his boyhood. Although he did not continue to be um, active in the Quaker faith as an adult and never lived in Oregon again, he lived by the values he learned as a child, and these values inspired many of his most impressive accomplishments. Many of you are probably familiar with the Hoover Minthorn House Museum and know it's the only presidential house in the Northwest. We are also the oldest house in Newburgh and the only museum in Newburgh at the present time. If you haven't been to the Hoover Minthorn House Museum recently, I encourage you to visit. Uh, we have special, several special events that we're going to do this year or put on, including a production of First Lady Lou a play, a one-woman, two-act play about Lou Henry Hoover, Hoover's remarkable wife, and we hope to have an interpretive exhibit um, related to that, and an exhibition of flower sacks um, from the Hoover Presidential Library in West Branch, Iowa, and I'll tell you more about the flower sacks later. In this talk, I will focus on Hoover's Oregon childhood and its impact on his adult life. Herbert Hoover is pictured here in San Francisco, shortly before he was elected president. At this point, he was one of the most popular individuals in America, recognized for monumental food relief programs in Europe and for a quick, effective response to the Mississippi flood of 1927. He won the presidential election by a landslide. Within five years after serving as president, he became one of the country's most unpopular citizens. Many consider, and still, consider him responsible for the Great Depression or for its slow recovery. He lost re-election by a landslide. As one of the most highly respected and as one of the most reviled, Hoover acted according to deeply held Quaker values taught in part by his foster family in Oregon. When Hoover came to Oregon in 1955 on his 81st birthday to dedicate the Hoover Minthorn House Museum, he spoke about his memories in his Oregon childhood. It will take me just a minute to bring this up, but I thought you might be interested to hear uh, just a few minutes of his uh, dedication address. So. Oops. Let's see. Secretary McKay, Governor Smith, my old friends in Newburgh, and your guests. It's a great honor to have been invited by the governor and the legislature of Oregon. Can you hear that? To spend my birthday on the scenes of my boyhood. Also, it's a great pleasure to take part in the dedication of this pump cottage. Its restoration has been due to largely to my old boyhood friend, Mr. Barker, and to the Reverend Pennington and the people of this community. Mr. Barker has risen high in the service of this state. <laughs> And Dr. Pennington has given this community years of speaker of spiritual leadership. But this is a time and a place of stimulated affections and recollections. In this cottage and its orchard, 
with its cherries and its apples and its pears. I spent the formative years of my boyhood. Here I roamed the primitive forest with their carpets of flowers, their ferns, their never forgettable fragrance. There was no legal limit on the fish you could take and no warden demanded to see your license. <laughs> and from those impressions on Oregon boys comes always the call to return again and again. I have omitted a reference in the, to my boyhood contacts with Poison Oak here about well, that's not part of the call. I was brought here, as you've already been told, just 70 years ago to live in the family of my Uncle John Minthorn. And Uncle John was a country doctor. That was his purpose and his inspiration of life. My first day at Newburgh was spent in making the acquaintance of uh, lovable Aunt Laura. My aunt was rather a stern person with disciplinarian ideas. She had few words and they were mostly devoted to the moral requirements. But she relaxed at times when I needed to go fishing or explore these woods. When I arrived on the Oregon scene, she was busy with my girl cousin making the winter store of pearl butter from pears which grew plentifully in this yard and I see they still grow. I had never eaten a pear before as my family circumstances in the Midwest did not permit that uh, exotic luxury. She showed me how to uh, stir the kettle and indicated that I had to keep it going without any stops. But at the same time, she said characteristically, they can eat all the pears they like. I like that idea. I liked it too much. And then she had to tuck a sick small boy into bed. And I ceased to eat any kind of a pear for a long, long time. <laughs> And one of my chores was to split the wood for the stove. Let's see. I don't know if you could all hear that, but he was recounting his first day in Newburgh when he um, overindulged on pears. He proceeded the next 19 minutes of his talk to talk about how the Hoover Minthorn House Museum was a testament to rural doctors. And he didn't mention himself very much uh, anymore at all. So the following year, there was a portrait already of um, that Dr. Barker had um, uh, commissioned that was in the museum but the next year, in 1956, the Oregon Medical Society had commissioned a portrait of Dr. Henry John Minthorn, and that stands in our parlor, is hung in our parlor. Dedication Day was a big day in Newburgh. It was attended by over 3,000 people. Here are some of Herbert Hoover's Newburgh classmates. And here he is with his childhood friend, Bert Brown Barker, in the, in the upper right. Bert Brown Barker, as I've mentioned, was responsible for the renovation um, and restoration of the house as a museum. The house was built in 1881, um, but by the middle of the next century, it had fallen into disrepair. Concerned citizens organized a foundation in 1947 to purchase it and restore it to its original appearance, drawing in part on Hoover's memory and in part on the memories of the two women who had grown up in the house after the Minthorns uh, moved out. The late Senator Mark Hatfield, pictured here on the lower left, 
was a devoted Hoover friend and scholar. Throngs of people waited to go through the Hoover Minthorn House Museum for the first time on August 10, 1955. In 1975, the museum was listed on the National Register of Historic Places because it is a presidential home. These are four basic Quaker values. Interpretation of these values can vary widely, but some of Hoover's public service work shows how he put one or more of these values into practice, and biographers generally maintain that Hoover's Quaker background had a profound influence on his adult life. William Luchtenberg wrote, to a degree, the Society of Friends left lasting imprints on Hoover's character and temperament, his self-reliance, his disdain for show, and his capacity for toil, and on his view of the world, his dutiful commitment to good works, his trust in a community of neighbors to sustain the needy, his pursuit of peace, and his conception of ordered freedom. So let's take a look at Hoover's childhood. Herbert Hoover was born August 10, 1874, to a Quaker family living in a small cottage illustrated here in West Branch, Iowa. His father, Jesse Hoover, was a blacksmith. Within four years of Hoover's birth, his father became the owner of a farm implement store, and the family moved to a larger house. Hoover's mother, Hulda Minthorn Hoover, educated as a teacher, was a minister, loosely, um, but she was very active in the Quaker community. Hoover also had an older brother, Theodore, born in 1871, and a younger sister, Mary, born about two years um, after Hoover was born, 18, about 1876. Their father died of a heart attack, rheumatism of the heart, on December 13, 1880, when Hoover was six. Hoover was sent to live with an uncle who was an Indian agent, Dr. Lab or, excuse me, uh, Laban Miles on the Osage Reservation in Oklahoma. Another summer, he lived with another uncle in a sod house in Sioux County, Iowa. He had a great variety of homes um, in his early childhood where he lived. When he was nine, his mother died of pneumonia that developed into typhoid fever. That was February of 1884. Hoover was nine years old. Following their parents' death, relatives separated the children and placed them into different homes. Bert was sent to live with his uncle, Alan Hoover, who was a farmer, north of West Branch. Dr. Henry John Minthorn and his wife, Laura, had lost their only son, Benjamin, in an accident in Forest Grove in 1884. The Minthorns, by this time, this next year, 1885, the Minthorns had moved to Newburgh, and they asked their Iowa relatives to send Bert to Newburgh by train so he could live with them and attend the Friends Pacific Academy. So Bert left West Branch on November 12, 1885. He brought all his belongings and all the food he needed with him. He had enough food to share with the family who had been asked to look out for him on the train. Dr. Minthorn met him on the train in, at the train in Portland and brought him down to Newburgh in his buggy. Hoover was 11 when he came to Newburgh to live with the Minthorn family. It was the fifth house he had joined. He was shy and reserved and very self-reliant. You probably have seen this photograph before of early Newburgh. Newburgh was not incorporated until um, 1889 uh, after Hoover had already left Newburgh. When he arrived in 18. 85, it probably would have looked very similar to this from the north. Jesse Edwards had owned about 160 acres, mostly visible in this photograph, and the property um, that became the Hoover Minthorn House had a farmhouse on it. Um, Edwards raised the farmhouse and built the current museum, which is visible on the very far left. Edwards had also opened a store on the opposite corner of a block that he platted, and it's also visible in this photograph. The Friends Pacific Academy is at the far right. 
half off of the photograph. Also visible are an orchard, a field, church, and other houses and barns. Smoke, I noticed, is coming out of most of the chimneys, so it must have been a fairly cold or cool morning or evening when the photo was taken. When Dr. Minthorn and his family uh, moved to Newburgh in 1885, Dr. Minthorn became the first superintendent of the Evangelical Friends Pacific Academy, forerunner of George Fox University. His wife, Laura Minthorn, was the head of the elementary school. The Minthorns had two daughters, Tennessee and Gertrude. A third daughter, Mary, was born in Newburgh in 1887. Herbert already knew the Minthorns. When he was two years old, his family thought he had died from the croup. His Aunt Agnes wrote, we all thought he was dead. The eyes of the infant were pressed closed with pennies and a sheet drawn over his body. But after resuscitation by his uncle John Minthorn, Herbert stirred to life. So it's that close. In Newburgh, um, at the Minthorns, Bert had for the first time his own bedroom. Hoover is shown in this photo above the blue arrow. About his life in Newburgh, he wrote, I was at once put to school and the chores. These included feeding the doctor's team of ponies twice a day, hitching them up periodically, milking the cow and splitting the wood. All this routine, plus the abundant religious occasions, somewhat interrupted the constant call for exploration of the Oregon forests and streams. That, however, was accomplished in time. Repression of the spirit of boys is not a Quaker method, and the mild routines have their values. Somehow I found time for baseball, jigsaws, building dams, swimming, fishing, and exploring the woods with other boys. When it did not interfere with school hours, Dr. Minthorn occasionally took me on his visits to patients. Sometimes I drove and held the team when he went in. They were profitable journeys to me, the doctor was mostly a silent, taciturn man, but still a natural teacher. He told me much of physiology, health, and sickness. I know you can't see this very well, but it's a letter. It's called the first example of uh, um, Hoover's uh, handwriting. It was written when he was about 12 years old to a little girl named Daisy Trueblood, who was the new girl in school. And as uh, you'll be able to tell when I read this to you, he was fairly enamored of her. <laughs> friend Daisy, and I hope you are more than my friend, although I do not dare to hope to head it that way yet, you do not know the extent to which I am enthralled. And I'm sure that no girl should have such mastery over any person's heart unless there are such feelings in her own heart. I could not have helped paying my attentions to you if I'd tried, and I'm sure I did not try very hard. I do not think you care, do you? Answer this, please, Bert. I think this letter was surfaced in Newburgh about the time um, that the house was made into a museum, and I believe that Bert Brown Barker shared it with, uh, sent the original to West Branch. I'm not sure of the, what happened to it, but I, we don't have the original in our collection but I do think it may have been at one time either, it was someplace in Newburgh, either with the museum or possibly at George Fox. This is kind of one view of Hoover um, and his uh, feelings. And another is kind of portrayed by um, a woman who was 87 years old when she wrote about her memories of Hoover as a little boy, she described him as stodgy, unkempt, always hungry, and poorer than other boys. I recall him in so many different circumstances, and all of them are tinged with a bit of pathos, as if life had treat, cheated him of his full share of, in, of youthful enjoyment, whether he was cutting wood, doing his chores at the barn, or bringing in water to the house. He had a sorry attitude, not sullen, but thoughtful beyond his years. Hoover remembered his very early family life with his own parents as happy and carefree. The death of his parents was perhaps, or was surely, the most profound influence on his character. He's one of only two presidents uh, who were orphans. Um, the other one, Andrew Jackson, 
was 14 when his mother died. It's a big difference. Sundays were spent in Sabbath school, church attendance, Bible study, and meetings of the Band of Hope, a children's temperance organization. Hoover was very religious. Biographer George Nash reports that on his bedroom wall in Newburgh, Hoover had two Bible quotations that his mother had given him, and I'm sure these were a source of strength to him. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation, from Psalms, and I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee, from Hebrews. Hoover's Quaker Sunday School teacher, Evangeline Martin, illustrated here, became a devoted friend. Hoover is shown on the far right. He visited Miss Martin in 1926 after she had suffered a stroke, and he was very famous. There were newspaper headlines that said, Hoover has disappeared, where is he? He probably spent part of that time fishing, but he also visited Miss Martin, and he assisted her financially at the end of her life. In September 1887, Hoover's brother Theodore arrived from Iowa, and during that school year, the two boys slept in a room in one of the academy buildings. Hoover earned his board by working for Benjamin Miles, Laura Minthorne's father, who was at the academy at that time. The Minthorns moved to Salem in February of 1888 and lived in this house. The house is standing, but it's been so changed, it's virtually unrecognizable. In September of 1888, um, Herbert moved to Salem to help his uncle with the Oregon Land Company. He wrote, when I was about 15 years old, Dr. Minthorne started a Quaker land settlement business at Salem with Charles Moore, Ben Cook, and others, and I was offered the distinguished position of office boy. I, there I worked for two years, living in the doctor's home, now moved to Salem, under Aunt Laura's kindly but very efficient inspections, sometimes I slept in the back office after night school. I drew a salary ranging from $15 to $20 a month. The bookkeeper of the firm used some of my off time, and in return, I received early instruction in bookkeeping. By the time he finished at the Oregon Land Company, I think he was making um, $35 a month, and he used some of that money to buy a bicycle. First he bought a big front wheeler and then he bought one that had, um, was called a safety bike with two wheels that were more the same size. In the evenings, Hoover sometimes attended classes at the Salem Business College, shown here, but he did not attend high school. While he was in Salem, he met a mining engineer and decided that was what he wanted to become. He knew he would have to attend college the Minthorns wanted him to attend an Eastern school like his brother Theodore was doing. But Hoover had heard about a new, a, a new college in California that was offering engineering as a major. The Salem Business College building is also still standing, but again, it's been completely altered um, so that it would be unrecognizable today. However, the Salem Baggage Depot um, is being restored. Uh, it's, <clears throat> excuse me. The Oregon Department of Transportation is partnering with several organizations, agencies, and individuals to restore the baggage depot um, at the Salem Railroad Station, and it will be marked as a location uh, that um, is associated with Hoover's time living in Salem. A mathematics professor, Joseph Swain, held examinations for entrance to Stanford University in 1891. Hoover took the tests, and he did poorly, except in mathematics. Swain encouraged Hoover to go to the campus in California to study and take the tests again. When he left Oregon, his maternal grandmother, who was living with the Minthorns at this time with May, his sister, uh, came to see him off at the train station. Hoover was in the first class at Stanford. He worked his way through school as a typist, and in summer he was employed by the U.S. Geological Survey, at least one summer. He was the financial manager of the football team, and he organized the first big game with the uh, University of California. 
He started off in mechanical engineering, but he switched to geology because of Professor Branner. Um, uh, what, um, he took a class in geology from Professor Branner, and that appealed to him a lot, so he switched his major to geology. After he graduated in 1895, he found a job as a typist for uh, Louis Janin, um, which had the preeminent mining firm in California at that time. He was able to assist when Janin served as an expert witness in a trial between two um, gold mining companies and immediately Janin then made him a partner. In 1897, Hoover went to work, that was the, the following year then, uh, for an international mining company, Bewick Mooring and Company. And uh, Bewick sent him to Western Australia, where he became an efficiency expert at operating mines. We have some correspondence in um, our archive uh, from a woman in West Australia who sent us pictures of the house he lived in in that area. Be fun to, to go see that. I guess it's still standing and looks pretty much the same. While Hoover was at Stanford, he met in his geology lab Lou Henry, who had been born in Iowa also, not far from West Branch. She studied ge uh, geology at Stanford, and she was the first woman to graduate from Stanford in geology. While he was working in Australia, he sent a cable to Lou to ask her to marry him, and she responded yes. They were married in Monterey the February after she graduated, February 10th, 1899. They sailed for China the next day, um, and throughout the time uh, that they were in China, he was traveling um, and uh, visiting mines, and during his absences, Lou Henry learned Chinese. She was very good at languages, and she began a collection, a lifelong collect collecting hobby of uh, Chinese porcelains. In June 1900, they came under fire in Tianjin during the Boxer Rebellion. They then moved to London, where in 1903, their son Bert was born, and in 1907, their second son, Alan. So, by 1914, uh, Hoover um, had uh, decided that he was going to change the direction of his life. He had earned um, enough money that he wanted to go into public service. He was kind of considering different directions. One biographer said he said he wanted to enter the big game. He maybe was getting interested in politics. He also looked at buying a newspaper. So a new phase began in 1914. The Hoovers were living in London. But let's look at um, some of uh, Hoover's public service activities in the light of these Quaker values that he learned, earn, learned as a child. Excuse me. Okay. American individualism. Individualism has been the primary force of American civilization for three centuries. Our very form of government is the product of individualism of our people, the demand for an equal opportunity for a fair chance. Hoover wrote this in a little booklet called American Individualism. Being orphaned at nine, his upbringing as a Quaker and the hard work he did as a child probably most influenced his desire to be self-sufficient. Another biographer wrote, um, Hoover's most significant personality trait was his individualism. He derived much of this philosophy from Quakerism, some from personal experience. Hoover um, defined the, his philosophy as a synthesis, partly borrowed from his personal experience. A year, the year after Hoover became president, 1930, he convened a White House conference on child health and protection, which drafted the Children's Charter. I know you can't see this very well. It's a, cop a, a slide from a copy of the charter that we have in the Hoover Minthorn House Museum. And among the different tenets that were held to be basic rights for children was one, for every child understanding and the guarding of his personality as his most precious right. Hoover also said, my country owes me nothing. It gave me as it gives every boy and girl a chance. 
It gave me schooling, independence of action, opportunity for service and honor, equal opportunity for the individual. It's a second value, charity. Richard Norton Smith was uh, at one time the president of the Presidential Library at West Branch and he wrote in 1982, Herbert Hoover saved more lives through his various relief efforts than all the dictators of the 20th century together could snuff out. Hoover believed in volunteerism and cooperation and he preferred to engage the public in these efforts rather than to increase federal programs. This approach was um, exemplified in the relief efforts he undertook between 1914 and 1928. He became the head of the Commission for Relief of Belgium in 1914. He undertook food relief efforts again in 1917 as food administrator to guide efforts to conserve resources to provide food to allies. And nearly all Americans knew that to Hooverize meant rationing of household materials. In 1918, he was the head of the European Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, which channeled 34 million tons of American food, clothing, and supplies to 20 countries. He was appointed um, Secretary of Commerce in 1921, a position he held for nine years under the administrations of both President Harding and President Coolidge. As Secretary of Commerce, he headed the Mississippi flood relief efforts of 1927. As President, Hoover donated his salary to Cherry, Charity, one of only two presidents to do so. The other was John Kennedy. Let's uh, talk a little bit more about his, the Commission for Relief of Belgium in 1914. These images show a ship loaded with food crossing the Atlantic and, and uh, also Belgian children waiting to be fed. In 1914, when the Belgian people were on the verge of starvation, the American ambassador approached Hoover about a solution. He accepted an offer to set, head up a famine relief effort for Belgium. He created the Commission for Relief in Belgium that fed 11 million people in Belgium and German-occupied northern France over four years. The CRB shipped almost 700 million tons, pounds, excuse me, pounds, of flour to Belgium. Sugar and grains may also have been sent, and Belgian relief efforts were supported by Her Herbert Hoover's personal fortune. More than once, he made personal pledges far in excess of his, person, his whole entire total personal wealth. His belief in charity may have prompted him to undertake arguably the greatest relief efforts ever attempted. Many of the empty flower sacks were sent to women's embroidery workshops where the women used them to make clothing and other articles. Sometimes the sacks were simply decorated by outlining a mill logo and the brand name of the flower. Other times original designs were created. Frequent additions to the flower sacks were Belgian messages of gratitude to the Americans with images such as Belgian and American flags, the Belgian lion and the American eagle, symbols of peace, strength, and courage. The Belgian colors of red, yellow, and black, and the American colors of red, white, and blue. The flower sack on the right was made into a pillow that Hoover kept in his rooms at the Waldorf Astoria until he died. Some of these sacks are part of the holdings in the Presidential Library at West Branch, and we are hoping to host a collection of the flower sacks at the Hoover Minthorn House Museum this fall. In 1917, Hoover became the Food Administrator. The Food Administration was the organization responsible for administration of Allied Forces food relief. Herbert Hoover appealed to the American housewife to conserve food and eliminate waste. By this voluntary effort, the country was able to reduce consumption of food by 15%. By promising a fair price to farmers uh, for agricultural produce and guaranteeing a market for surplus, Hoover gained cooperation of American farmers and U.S. food shipments to Europe tripled. 
In 1921, Hoover offered food relief to starving Russians through the American Relief Administration, which was then winding up child relief in Russia. Between 1921 and 1923, at the height of the famine, Americans were feeding 18 million people in Russia. More than 600,000 people were driven from their homes in the flood of 1927. 300 people died, 20,000 square miles were flooded. Herbert Hoover directed that tent cities be constructed on high ground near the flooded areas and coordinated eight agencies, the Red Cross and 91 local communities to provide relief. Children received balanced diet and vaccinations, many of whom had not had adequate food or vaccinations before, before the flood. Through appeals on the radio and in the press, Hoover was able to raise $15 million for the Red Cross and obtained a million dollar grant from the Rockefeller Foundation. The Flood Credits Corporation made $10 million available in low interest loans to small farmers and businessmen affected by the flood. No federal funds were involved in the recovery and through this, these enormous humanitarian relief programs, Hoover practiced charity on an international level. It's the third value, freedom. Hoover wrote, men must be free to worship, to think, to hold opinions, excuse me, to hold opinions, to speak without fear. They must be free to challenge wrong and oppression with surety of justice. Freedom conceives that the mind and spirit of man can only be free, can be free only if he is free to pattern his own life, to develop his own talents, free to earn, to spend, to save, to acquire property as the security of his old age and his family. These freedoms have been embodied uh, as the four freedoms by um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, but Hoover saw a fifth freedom, that of economic freedom, freedom for men to choose their own calling to accumulate property and protection of their children in old age, and freedom of enterprise that does not injure others. His, one of his biographers, Kendrick A. Clements wrote, although Quakers believed deeply that individuals must seek guidance directly from God through the inner light, they also sought order and harmony in society. By constantly redirecting believers' attention to these common concerns, a degree of conformity was subtlety, subtly inculcated with the Quaker community. Quakers, Hoover would later say, believed in liberty, but in an ordered liberty. Herbert Hoover's view of ordered liberty can be shown in his role as Secretary of Commerce and as President. He was, in other words, not a laissez-faire politician. As Secretary of Commerce, Hoover worked tirelessly to improve the efficiency of the government he started standardization programs in the government and worked for elimination of waste. Hoover wanted to create a more organized economy that would regularize the business cycle, eliminating ebbs and flows and generate higher rates of economic growth. You can see in the depression what happened when this wasn't done. Hoover was involved in so much of the government that pres ex at that time President Calvin Coolidge called him Secretary of Commerce and undersecretary of everything else. This was ordered liberty. One of his biographers, George Nash, said, he was a quiet, patient, honorable man of obvious integrity and great diligence who had hardly been sworn in as president when great financial disaster struck. He did his best to end the depression. According to Hoover's conviction, convictions, individualism demanded that private institutions provide relief, but humanitarianism, humanitarianism called for federal aid. As a result, Hoover did more than any previous president to relieve the widespread distress, paving the way for the anti-depression New Deal measures. He introduced banking reform legislation created the Reconstruction Finance Corporation in 1932, developed an agricultural credit system, and convened an economic conference to promote trade 
and stabilize currencies. As president, Hoover instituted public works programs that authorized $635 million in construction projects. Freedom ordered liberty. After Hoover was defeated um, for re-election, he kind of went into retirement during the um, administration of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. But within months after President Truman uh, was in office, he was called back to the government and asked to work on the uh, Hoover um, commissions. It was the first Hoover Commission and the second Hoover Commission. One of his biographers, Kendrick Clement, said on a fourth Quaker value, the value of conscientious work. This speaks to his commitment to conservation, which played a role in these Hoover commissions. With his emphasis on American individualism and his search for ways to decentralize control over conservation moved um, to de in that direction while Secretary of Commerce and President and after 1932, his aversion to New Deal sometimes led him to express extreme free market anti-governmental sentiments. But in the end, he always believed that a positive role for government was necessary to protect the public interest and prevent abuses by selfish individuals. One of his favorite pastimes, fishing, was developed in his childhood in Oregon. We're moving away from his four Quaker values in public service. He was given his first fly fishing rod when he was growing up in Oregon, and he continued to fish at every opportunity throughout his life. When he wrote about the virtues of fishing, his words conveyed much of his philosophy of life. He wrote, um, fishing is the discipline in the equality of man, for all men before fish are equal. Part of uh, Hoover's love of the out of doors was an outgrowth of his Quaker rearing, as well as his exposure to woods, prairies, lakes, and streams in a relatively pristine environment such as he found in Oregon. However, Clemens uh, also wrote, fishing may have been his greatest joy, but it was a guilty pleasure. The stern tenets of frontier Quakerism blocked the rebel child's hope of escape but the struggle never ended. Hoover internalized Quaker values and they served him well, bringing him material success and a generally happy and productive life. But at some level, he always resented that those values had been forced upon him and not freely chosen. So what impact did Hoover's Oregon boyhood have on his adult life? Individualism, charity, freedom, conscientious work, Biographer Clements wrote, somewhere in his subconscious there was always the voice of one of his Quaker relatives telling that work must come before pleasure. Even in his old age, he sometimes postponed fishing trips in order to work. And when he did go, he always brought along a pad and pencil so he could make notes of things that needed to be done. Hoover told a friend that he was 12 years old in his strict Quaker family before he realized if you did anything for your own personal happiness and satisfaction, God wouldn't strike you dead. After Hoover's death in 1964, when he was 90, the retired president of George Fox University, Levi T. Pennington, spoke at a memorial service held in Newburgh. In his address, Pennington said, his enemies could attack his philosophy, his economic tenets. They could blame him for a world crisis for which he had no responsibility and which he could in, in large part have not, have avoided, excuse me, which he could in large part have averted with the right political cooperation. But there was no flaw in his armor of moral rectitude. So please come visit us at the Hoover Minthorn House Museum. It's owned and operated by the National Society of the Colonial Dames of America in Oregon and has original furniture that was actually used by Herbert Hoover when he was living uh, in Newburgh between 1885 and 1888. So thank you.
Yes. Can you tell us, is there a website for the museum? There is. There is. And we list our, we have some photographs and list our special events and we have our hours, which now, now that it's March, are Wednesday through Sunday from 1 to 4. But I'm always happy to arrange special tours if you call. So any other questions? How many of you have been to the Hoover Minthorn House Museum? That's fantastic. How many have been to the Hoover Minthorn House Museum in the last year and a half? Yes. <laughs> well, come back. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Very okay, I think that will conclude uh, our meeting for today. Uh, remember April uh, 13th, right here, 1.30. See you next time. Bye-bye.